What? It's good for you. Hello, my friends. Look at this, huh? Yeah, a new video style, a new layout, a new topic. What is going on here? I don't know. I just wanted to try something different. But there actually is a lot I want to talk about. It's just nice to take a break from Pokemon once in a while, you know? The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, I feel like everybody is at least aware of the existence of this series in some way. Even just seeing advertisements in a Target or something. I mean, it has been around since the mid-80s, and is currently Nintendo's fourth best-selling franchise in its history, only behind the Wii series at 3, Pokemon at 2, and Mario at 1. If you are at all a Nintendo fan, I think it's fair to say that you have at least played one Zelda game in your life, maybe even loved one of them. A typical Zelda game is an adventure-style action game with some RPG and fantasy elements where you take on the role of the elven hero Link as you progress through a specific world defeating monsters and dungeons as you ultimately aim to save Princess Zelda from Ganon and reacquire the Triforce to save the land. This is a very general synopsis as there are many different variations of this throughout the series. At the time of me writing this, Tears of the Kingdom has just come out and well, I have some conflicted thoughts on where I stand with it. So what I want to do is really try and figure out where I stand with this series, because I feel like it's pretty complicated. And I still want to make it as enjoyable for you by taking you all down memory lane. So I want to make the structure of this video very clear. I'm not going to be talking about the series in chronological or release order or anything like that. I want to talk about the order of the games in which I played them throughout my life, from childhood to present day. So there will be games that I won't even mention throughout the series, because I've never played them. I'll have nothing to say about them. So rather than go through the series in order and talk about games that I know nothing about, I'm only going to talk about the ones that I do know anything about. I'm going to briefly discuss the plot and the game mechanics and all that, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. These aren't really going to be as much reviews as they are reflections. So please, grab a red potion, put on your bunny hood, and let's discuss The Legend of Zelda. <laughs> always happens. The Legend of Zelda was released for the NES in Japan in 1986, the very same year that I was born. It wouldn't reach North American stores until mid-1987. Now, first of all, I have an older brother who is nine years older than me. My entire introduction to video gaming is through him, and I was pretty much restricted to only playing games that he got. As early as I can remember, we did have an NES in the house, but to be honest, it didn't really last too long before it stopped working. Most of my experience with the system was watching him play games, but I was way too young to remember much of anything. I honestly couldn't tell you if we owned The Legend of Zelda or rented it from the video store or what, but it was played in our house at some point. I can picture very brief flashes of maybe seeing the title screen in the first few screens. I may or may not have played it myself, but I don't recall. I was aware that this game existed, though. I have more vivid memories of watching him play Castlevania 2 and Mega Man 3 than this game. And the same goes for Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. I can remember seeing the overworld screen, but not much beyond that. So for the time being, they were not games I had any ties to, but I did know of them at that young age. It wouldn't be until the third game in the series came out, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, where everything would change for me in particular. My brother and I did get a Super Nintendo for Christmas, I think the holiday season of 1991 when it was released here with Super Mario World being our first game as it came with the system. A Link to the Past came out in April the following year where we lived, so I really don't know if it was one of our birthday gifts or a Christmas gift that year or what, but anyway, we most certainly did get it. And I even still have that exact copy in front of me as I'm typing this out. This game was phenomenal to me at the time and was my real true introduction to the series, as I was at least old enough now to process story elements and gameplay mechanics and actually play it myself. It follows the general story layout that I discussed in the intro. You control Link in the land of Hyrule and must trek through the dungeons in the light and dark world in order to save not only Princess Zelda from the Dark Lord Ganon, but the Seven Sages as well. It's shown in a very colorful top-down perspective as you control Link in nine different directions, utilizing your sword and shield as well as the many items you find along the way, such as bombs and the boomerang. This may be the third game in the series, but I feel like it is the prototypical Zelda experience. I don't quite remember if my brother and I played it together or separately from each other, but I'm sure he helped me out through certain areas at different times. 
Once you beat the first three dungeons and get the pendants, you get the legendary Master Sword, and are soon cast into the Dark World, which is basically a parallel world to the one you've just been exploring, except everything has a much darker, hopeless, and sinister tone to it, as it is where Ganon resides. This concept alone was just so cool for me to grasp at the time. It's the same world, it just looks different. Keep in mind, I'm like 6 or 7 playing this, so this is some intense storytelling for a game. I was used to simpler storytelling like in Super Mario World and watching my brother play Castlevania and stuff. A Link to the Past really was the first game I played with an immersive narrative, and I loved it. I trekked on through that dark world, figuring out difficult puzzles for my little second grade mind. I remember getting stuck at varying points throughout the dark world. The Dark Palace is the first dungeon there, and I can remember having difficulty in one room with one-way jumps. Skull Woods is the third dungeon in the Lost Woods, and there were so many different paths to take, and the enemies seemed tougher there. The boss is even in a room with conveyor belts surrounded by moving spikes all around. This was a lot to get through. I also specifically remember both my brother and I getting stuck on how to even get into the fifth dungeon, the Ice Palace, as it involved going between both the light and dark world. It's obviously important to know that there was really no internet back then. We had to rely on our wits, and maybe word of mouth if we were lucky. Turtle Rock was incredibly difficult too. But you know what? Over time, I felt like I really persevered. I eventually did conquer Ganon's tower and Ganon himself to save Zelda. I finally started to feel like I was getting good at video games. This long, arduous adventure game had finally been bested by this 6 or 7 year old. So I played through it again, remembering how to get through certain parts this time around. I even have this fond memory of using a little tape recorder with a cassette tape to actually record the audio of me narrating the end where I defeated Ganon. That's right, I was doing a Let's Play podcast in 1992. Fun side fact, the tape recorder that I used in my Mega Man Challenge video is actually the very same one that I recorded my uh, Link to the Past Let's Play back in 1992. Well, it's probably not the exact same one, since I did buy this from a thrift store, but it's the exact same Fisher-Price model. I mean, I did buy it from my hometown, so it's possible that it's the exact one I used as a kid, but what are the odds of that, you know? Basically, A Link to the Past is incredibly special to me, and has some of my most fondest memories in gaming, and I chalk it up to being THE game that got me to experience cognitive thinking in video gaming. The nostalgia for it is real. So how do I feel about it now? Well, I have no desire to ever play it again. <laughs> yeah, I said it. The enjoyment factor for it has completely dissipated for me over the years. A Link to the Past has kind of become the Bohemian Rhapsody of the Zelda series for me. You know, it's it's an excellent game, but I've played it so many times, watched so many videos on it, that it's just the enjoyment factor is gone for me at this point. But that would actually be it for Zelda in our home for quite a while. I know at one point I did own the Legend of Zelda board game, but I don't really remember what happened to it or why I don't have it anymore. I don't remember even how to play it, I just remember that you collect hearts or something, and I remember there was a, like, a Tektite tile. But other than that, um, yeah, I don't really have a lot of, like, specific memories of it, but I liked it. But at the time, A Link to the Past was the only Zelda game that we owned, so if you wanted to play any Zelda, it was basically just a link to the past. So fast forward all the way to Christmas of 1998. I'm now 12 years old, which is very different from being 6 years old. My brother was now 21 and living away at college, so I would pretty much only see him on weekends and holidays. But we did get a Nintendo 64 for the Christmas of, what, 1996, so I was well familiar with the controls and the games at that point. But oh man, the hype for this new Zelda game on the Nintendo 64 was also real. I remember seeing old advertisements in Nintendo Power and stuff. I could be misremembering it, but I think it was just called Zelda 64 for a while until it got its actual title of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It is really the only thing I wanted that Christmas, and I was all in on experiencing this throughout that Christmas break. And oh dear lordy lord did it not disappoint. It's no secret to anybody just how important this game's release was in video gaming history. It's one of Nintendo 64's best-selling games of all time. It got rave reviews across the board, it put Link and Zelda into the 3D perspective, and even still to this day, tops so many lists as one of the best video games of all time. Game-wise, it actually follows the structure of A Link to the Past very closely. You control Link in the Land of Hyrule, where you use your sword and shield and items you collect along the way to defeat monsters in the dungeons, save Princess Zelda, defeat Ganon, and reacquire the Triforce in order to save the world. 
You even start the game conquering three dungeons, get the Master Sword, and then get transported to a bleaker world in the future where Ganon has taken over. I mean, there are so many similarities that it's practically a remake. But what sets Ocarina of Time apart is pretty much everything else. The characters are now 3D and in 3D environments instead of the standard pixelated top-down view that all the other games had, except for parts of Zelda 2, but we aren't there yet. The story is much more fleshed out with, in my opinion, more immersion, better characters, better settings and dungeons, amazing sound and music, much more versatile gameplay. I mean, this game was such a huge leap on what they could pull off at the time. Since my brother was really only around briefly that Christmas break, it was mostly me discovering how amazing this game was. He only briefly played it and never even got the Master Sword, which will be an important factor down the line. We'll get there. This was all I really wanted to do at the time. Well, that and watch Seinfeld. Along with your partner Navi the Fairy, you start the game in Kokiri Forest where you first learn how to use the sword in this new 3D environment, and then get tested inside the Deku Tree, the first dungeon. After that, you get to explore Hyrule Field, which felt enormous to me at the time. You could go anywhere you wanted here, and if a path was blocked by something, you could return later after getting new items and arsenal. Going north, you discover the new Kakariko Village, returning from A Link to the Past, and it is really here where you first see, in my opinion, a legit terrifying enemy. I love horror now, but I was not into horror at the time. Castlevania 4 and Uninvited were the extent of my horror video game experiences. Going into the graveyard, you eventually enter the royal family's tomb. It gives you a very uneasy feeling, contrasted by the calming music from the village. There are pools of green toxic water and green steam rising up. You hear some ominous moaning that sounds almost zombie-like as you see these figures standing there completely still with their heads down. If you even get near them, the screen freezes for a second as you hear this quick but shrill scream as the figure slowly approaches you with its black eyes, and if it reaches you, it jumps on your back to drain your energy. I mean, my god, this is in this bright and colorful Zelda game? This is horrifying. These are known as Re-Deads, and I could not believe how scary they made these things. And that's not it for the sinister scary stuff. Later on in the game, you fight this thing called a dead hand, and oh my god, this thing is the stuff of nightmares. Is it covered in blood? Why are there so many hands in the ground? Look at that face! Yeah, they really didn't hold back on some of the scary stuff in this game. Rated E for everyone, by the way. And as notoriously terrifying as the dead hand is, I think the re-deads are honestly worse. At least they were for me at the time. If you hear that scream, you better run and swing that sword all over the place. I will never forget the first time I entered that tomb. After that, you meet the friendly rock-eating creatures, the Gorons, and help them out in Dodongo's cavern. Then you meet the Zoras and conquer Jabu Jabu's belly, which is honestly my least favorite part of the game. It's just pretty gross. But once you get the Master Sword and get transported seven years in the future, you are now Adult Link and have even more dungeons to take over. I used to like Adult Link so much more than Child Link. He seemed like so much more of a badass, and I liked the look in his voice more. Ironically, the point of the game is to save the land so Link can still live out his childhood, but I still wanted to be Adult Link more. I think the game really picks up here, too. The Deku Tree is more of a tutorial dungeon, Dodongo's Cavern is slightly harder, and I don't care for Jabu Jabu's belly, but oh man. The Forest Temple is great. I love the atmosphere and the music here, and just the eerie quality of finding the Poe Ghosts. The Fire Temple is actually my favorite temple in the game, which I feel like is not a common opinion. I just love the look of it and rescuing the Gorons and even the end boss. If I think Ocarina of Time, I tend to picture the Fire Temple. But after that is the Water Temple, one of the most notoriously hated temples in the entire series. It's confusing, you have to constantly readjust the water level, what boots you have on, you get lost easily, and yeah, if you've played this game at all, I don't need to say anything more. It's the Water Temple. If you know, you know. But I don't know, I felt like I actually got through it pretty okay my first time playing it. I don't remember getting frustratingly stuck at any point. It can get annoying keeping track of where you are, but it never really bothered me. Still doesn't. With that said, it is probably my least favorite temple as Adult Link, but I never really hated it like a lot of people do. The Shadow Temple is probably my second least favorite, but yeah, there is some creepy stuff here too. They do a pretty good job making you feel uneasy here, but some of it can be annoying. I appreciate it for its atmosphere. 
The Spirit Temple tends to be a fan favorite, and I mostly agree. It's my second favorite temple in the game, and I think it has a pretty great layout, as you have to travel between both time periods. And then you get the epic showdown against Ganondorf, and oh man, it's such a fun boss. Just about everything about this game enthralled me, and I just loved exploring everywhere. Finding new things, paths, items, characters, everything. Whatever I say throughout this video, just know that even still, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is a top 5 favorite game of all time for me. A crazy statement to say, I know. But I was just the exact age at the right time when this came out to truly have very fond nostalgia for it. I remember I even got super sick that Christmas break to the point where I basically had to lay on the couch all day, and then having the memory of me finally feeling better so I could go explore Gerudo Valley for the first time. Unlike A Link to the Past, where it has so much meaning to me yet I don't really ever want to play it again, I could still go out and put Ocarina of Time on and love going through it. It's been years since I've played it now, so it's not like it's a common game I play or anything, but it just stood the test of time for me so much more than A Link to the Past did, and that makes it really special for me. So the next Zelda game I got to play was the spiritual sequel to Ocarina of Time, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, released in 2000. Even though my brother never actually went through Ocarina of Time, he and his wife did purchase Majora's Mask. They were both living at our house at the time, but they were going to be moving out pretty soon, so I did get to play Majora's Mask while it was in our house. Majora's Mask looks extremely similar to Ocarina of Time and pretty much controls the same way, so it was very easy to pick up and get going with. But oh man, I don't know if I was ready for what this game had to offer. A lot of people say it was ahead of its time, and uh, yeah, I would agree with that statement. Ocarina of Time was a fairly straightforward Zelda game, and like I said, really felt like a remake of A Link to the Past, which in itself was kind of already a remake of the original Legend of Zelda. But Majora's Mask is a very unique experience, and really explores some dark and unsettling themes that really stick with you the more you think about it. Link gets transported to a parallel land of Termina, which is literally under the threat of a giant moon with a horrifying looking face, about to crash into the planet in exactly three days to destroy it and everybody on it. The apocalypse looms on everybody's mind. Using the Ocarina of Time that Link obtains from the previous game, you are able to go back in time to the start of the three-day cycle to repeat the same three days all over again as many times as you want. On paper, that sounds like it would get boring and repetitive, but it's really not. You are constantly making yourself aware of what time it is and must plan out your actions accordingly because if you start to take too long, you'll have to play the Song of Time to go back and start the whole process over again. But the point is to conquer the dungeons in true Zelda fashion, as beating the bosses end up staying permanent for when you repeat the cycle. But wow, this game can get pretty deep, as you are able to converse with all of the townspeople, accepting their soon-to-be fate in different ways. The closer the moon gets, people start to act differently with varying forms of fate acceptance. You can help some of them with their problems, but not everyone, as you have a limited amount of time before you have to go back in time to figure out different puzzles. There's just so much creativity going on with this game, and it really is an excellent reverse side of the N64 Zelda coin. The two games are so similar in appearance and gameplay, but so different from one another that there's a good chance one or both will be for you. Since this wasn't a game that I myself owned, my memories of it are a bit foggier than with Ocarina, which I was able to play as much as I wanted. I absolutely loved Majora's Mask though, and I also have fond memories of helping my brother's fiancé play through it. As far as I know, my brother still has yet to ever play it, but my sister-in-law and I had so much fun going through it and it was really one of the last things we did before they moved out. This game introduced the masks that can turn Link into a sort of hybrid version of other creatures in the world that give you different abilities. You can become a Deku Scrub, a Goron, and a Zora, which adds a whole new layer to the gameplay. There are a lot of things that return here, but also a lot of new stuff to make it a new and refreshing experience. There are fewer temples than an ocarina, but it never felt like a lesser experience. The Woodfall and Snowhead temples stand out to me the most, where you alternate between Deku Scrub Link, Goron Link, and Regular Link. It was hard for me to say if I liked Ocarina or Majora more, as they are so close for me. I can definitively say now that Ocarina of Time simply has a lot more meaning for me, so it wins out now. But at the time, I really loved Majora's Mask, even though I wasn't really able to replay it. Being able to see this terrifying moon by looking up just inching its way closer to causing the apocalypse truly gives it a sense of dread. And I know I've said some spoilers in this video, but I'd rather really not get into the ending or the main boss of this game. I love how the story occurs and plays out. In my eyes, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are the Zelda series in its prime. I'm sure some agree with me and some heavily disagree, but I really think a lot of it has to do with my age at the time. 
At the end of 2000, I was 14 and things were about to be changing drastically. I went to a completely different school the first half of my freshman year, which was right around this time, and then I was homeschooled for the second half. And Majora's Mask and Pokemon Silver were the games for me at the time. I probably would have said that Zelda was my favorite game series back then. 2001 was when our family got our first computer with internet hookup, and that's kind of when I became aware of emulation and downloading ROMs to play them, but I'm pretty sure that my next actual Zelda experience was for the GameCube. Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages were released in 2001 for the Game Boy Color, and my brother did buy both of them, but for some reason neither of us played it. I know he wasn't ready to move on to that, but I never asked to borrow them or anything. I could be wrong, but I think he actually still has both of them in shrink wrap. <laughs> Probably worth a lot of money. However, March of 2003 is when the next 3D Zelda came out, The Wind Waker, for the GameCube. My brother did actually buy this game and let me borrow it, as I didn't have a job yet. I was a junior in high school and was a little leery and or disappointed at the cartoony style that they chose to go with, and I wasn't alone there. Ocarina of Time looked so awesome at the time, and Majora's Mask got even darker, so this was understandably a pretty big change to accept. It felt like it was going to be more geared towards children. So I started my Wind Waker game, and since I was borrowing it, I felt like I should play through it fairly quickly so I could give it back to them. The Wind Waker takes place quite a while after Ocarina and Majora, as the majority of the world has been taken over by water. Ganon has returned, and now there's a new hero of time, also named Link, set to once again follow the Zelda formula by conquering the dungeons and stopping Ganon. But the main feature here is how you navigate around the world. Link befriends a boat named King of Red Lions, who is able to help him sail around the seas to different islands around the world. As I said, I was a little leery of the art style, and the fact that a lot of it is a boat sailing game, but you know what? I really had a lot of fun and I loved playing it. But since I played through it in such a short time period, and it's now been 20 years since I did so, I unfortunately don't really have a lot of vivid memories of it. It was kind of like a flash in the pan experience. I remember actually enjoying sailing to new islands on the map to see what was on them and how bright and colorful everything was, but yeah, it just kind of happened and then it was done. I've still only beaten it the one time. But as I said before, it was about now when I learned about emulation, so if I wanted to, I could go back and play the Zelda games I never played before, like the original 2 or Link's Awakening or any of the Oracle games. I think I did download and play maybe The Legend of Zelda and Zelda 2, but I didn't, I don't think I got very far, I just gave up pretty quickly, I don't know. So fast forward all the way to December of 2006. I'm now 20 years old and there's a lot of hype for this new 3D Zelda experience. The Wind Waker was a lot of fun for me, but now it was time to move on to the actual, like, darker Ocarina Majora style Zelda experience. The Nintendo Wii was pretty new at this point, but I didn't have enough money to go out and buy one. I did still have my GameCube though. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was released for both systems thankfully, and I went and bought the GameCube version quite possibly on day one with what little money I had. Twilight Princess once again takes place in Hyrule, but many years after the events of Ocarina of Time. Yeah, the Zelda series likes to play with timelines and alternate universes and stuff. But you once again control Link, and yes, follow the same structure of completing dungeons to stop Ganondorf and save Hyrule and Zelda. You are now guided by an imp named Midna and have the ability to turn into a wolf. I remember being very impressed with how this game looked. The GameCube was a bit more powerful than the N64, so the darker tone with pretty impressive lighting at the time really made this game stand out. My friend George had recently moved back to my hometown and he and I would play Twilight Princess quite a bit after we get out of work or our classes at college. If I was at work and he was off, he'd be over at my house progressing his story and then the reverse. We would discuss our progress, and if one of us was stuck, we'd help each other out without directly saying what to do. It was a lot of fun, and was great to almost turn it into a co-op experience. The weird thing with this game is that the GameCube and the Wii version are completely flipped from each other. The character of Link is naturally left-handed, so the GameCube version that I know felt like the real version with left-handed Link. Since the Wii's gimmick was all about motion controls with the Wiimote, and the fact that most people are right-handed, the developers chose to have the Wii version flipped in reverse to have Link be right-handed. Like the entire world on a reverse axis. Very weird. I remember feeling so glad that I chose the GameCube one because I hated the sound of that idea. Also, I've never loved motion controls. But yeah, I really enjoyed Twilight Princess. To this day, that's the only time I've ever played it, so kinda like with Wind Waker, any specific memories for me are a bit fuzzy. The main thing that really stands out now is that George and I went through it simultaneously, so I do have good memories of it for that reason. 
I do remember being in wolf form in the dungeon in the snow with the yetis, but that's really about it. A few years later, for some reason, I decided to sell my copy of Twilight Princess. I honestly don't remember why I did this, because I'd love to own it again. I've gotten rid of a lot of games over the years that I wish I didn't. So for me, Twilight Princess lives in just 2006 and 2007. So weirdly enough, this is when things started to take an interesting turn for me. Fast forward all the way to 2013. Yeah, I didn't play any Zelda games for all that time period, unless you count maybe like another playthrough of Ocarina of Time or Link to the Past or something, I don't know. Phantom Hourglass, Spirit Tracks, Skyward Sword, they've all come out and I didn't get any of them. A Link Between Worlds was soon to be out and I started to really feel like I was getting behind on Zelda. You notice I didn't even mention games like the Minish Cap. Didn't get them, didn't play them. It was now 2013 and I was 27 years old and my brother and I got this idea. What if we went through every single Zelda game in order? Once one of us beats a game, we have to wait for the other one to finish it before we can move on to the next one. A true chronological experience. We felt very motivated to go through this series, so he downloaded the original Legend of Zelda for his Nintendo Wii, and I got mine for the 3DS. The Legend of Zelda, originally released for the NES in 1987 in North America, follows the story of Link trekking through the land of Hyrule to stop Ganon and rescue Zelda, and yeah, I'm really just repeating myself here. But this is the one that started it all, and I was finally ready to go through the game and complete it for the first time. This game is extremely open, with really not a lot of guidance on what to do and where to go. I was used to these somewhat newer games that gives you pretty definite tasks on what you're supposed to do and where to go, and it's the puzzle solving that you have to figure out in order to progress. This game is just like, the screen opens to Link standing in a field and, well, there you go. Figure it out from here and best of luck to you. You enter the cave in front of you and get your sword with one of the more infamous starting screens in video gaming. I actually have this It's Dangerous to Go Alone Take This Key holder. I don't really like that the sword is pictured here though because I like to imply that the keys are what you should be taking with you. Anyway, by playing this game for the first time on the 3DS, I was able to utilize the save state option, and boy did I utilize this. Save state allows you to stop the game at any point to literally save it at the exact second to reload it if you die or get stuck somewhere. I both love and hate this. It's so easy to abuse it, as later in the game I was saving state constantly. But the beauty of it is if you beat a tough boss or figure out a part, you don't have to go through and repeat what you just accomplished if you die. There are pros and cons to this, but I really tried my best here going through the game without looking up guides or anything. If I got stuck somewhere or had no idea on where I needed to go, I kinda asked for hints from my brother. Amazingly, he still remembered the game pretty well and was able to recall specific secrets and where to go and what trees to burn and stuff. So I guess we did have this game in our house back then for quite a while. The dungeons in this game have less of an environmental theme like a lot of the later games do with your typical forest temple, snow temple, water themed ones, etc. The walls have different colors here and you encounter different enemy types and that's about it. It's simple, but it's the original. The Land of Hyrule does have some series staples like the Lost Woods and Death Mountain, and it all started here. But eventually, I did it. I obtained all pieces of the Triforce, and my brother did as well. We both successfully beat the original Zelda, and it only took me, uh, about 26 years. I do think it's a lot of fun and holds up surprisingly well. It really is pretty unforgiving at times, and you really have to explore everywhere in order to find out where you need to go. That can obviously get frustrating at times, especially if you start to spend too much time wandering aimlessly, but it's just such an important game in gaming history. I really do think it's a good game, and it's understandable that it spawned the franchise that's still going to this day. So now it was time for the two of us to move on to Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, released in 1988 in North America, about a year after the original game. I was pretty aware of how difficult this game was, so I had my save states ready to go. So once again, he got it for the Wii and I got it for the 3DS, and we set off on our adventure of Link. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link follows the same Link from the original game who now has to restore the Triforce of Courage in order to awaken Zelda from a sleeping spell. But unlike the original game, this one tries to be a bit different. There is still the familiar top-down view where Link moves in four directions, but now that's designated to just the overworld. The main gameplay involves Link in a side-scrolling adventure combined with more RPG elements like leveling up and gaining experience points, and learning different spells. And Link can jump. It was a bit of a risk back then, but certainly is presented very differently from the first game. The reception on it was a bit... lukewarm, you could say, as there are groups of people who downright hate this game. 
It definitely has a following for doing something different, but my god is it hard. The side-scrolling combat with Link's tiny little sword is absolutely infuriating against some enemies. This game is not for the casual players. The first game was pretty tough, but that was more about finding where you need to go, and then the combat in later dungeons were difficult. This game can be difficult with just regular enemies at times. I really don't think I would have gotten through it if it weren't for the save state function. The final palace is pretty ridiculous. But I gotta say, at times it was actually pretty fun. I cannot argue for it being better than the first game, but I can also see why it has a following. I kinda like the experience point system and making Link stronger. It was like a combination of Final Fantasy and Castlevania more so than a Zelda game. But with time and patience, I actually did complete Zelda 2. Another game checked off the list. My brother had never beaten it by that point, so he was also determined to beat this chore of a game. I remember visiting him at his house and watching him go through the last palace to officially beat it for the first time. It was nice to see that he was struggling through it as much as I was, but that made it all the more rewarding to finally beat it. However, I can ultimately say that I really don't think Zelda 2 is a great game. While fun on occasion, the frustrations outweighed the good most of the time. I'm glad I finished it, but I will probably never play it again. It's a strange one. We both felt like we needed a little break after that, so by the time 2014 rolled around, we were both ready to move on to A Link to the Past. I already talked about it here, so I don't really have much more to add. I knew how to do everything, I knew where everything was, so I flew through it pretty quickly, but he was less familiar with it, so I kind of had to wait for him to catch up. Again, it's still an excellent game, but I think this is going to be maybe the last time I'll ever play it. But once my brother did beat it, oh boy, this is when the momentum really shifted. Our next game was going to be Link's Awakening for the original Game Boy. It was released in 1993 and then once again in 1998 for the Game Boy Color as the DX version. So for my brother's birthday, I decided to actually go out and physically buy the original Game Boy one, and then I bought it for myself so we could both start it a legit way rather than downloading it from an eShop or something or playing emulation. Except here's the thing. Yeah, his copy was broken and didn't work. You could test it out and you could play it for a couple minutes and then the game would freeze at the same point every single time. So that didn't work. So instead of going out and buying a new copy of it, we decided to, you know, take our time. So eventually we got the idea to each play it on the 3DS, but my brother didn't have a 3DS at the time. So once again, I decided to get him a 3DS for his birthday, so I went and bought a used copy from like Facebook Marketplace or something. And for some reason, I didn't test it out when I was buying it from the person, and there was no sound. The sound just didn't even work. So it was kind of like, well, he could play it in silence, but it's not, the, it's not the same experience. So then even more time passed, and we finally got him another 3DS, and this time it worked. Link's Awakening follows Link, who finds himself in a terrible storm at sea and wakes up on the mysterious Koholint Island. Things are pretty weird here, and there are even appearances of characters from other Nintendo franchises like Chain Chomps and Goombas from Mario, and even Dr. Wright from SimCity. Eventually, you discover that you're trapped in a dream world and must wake up the Windfish in order to return back to normal life. And I gotta be honest, this game really wasn't doing it for me, and I really don't know why. It wasn't the dated Game Boy Color graphics. I mean, my channel consists of old Pokemon and Pokemon TCG videos. I love the retro style but I just didn't find the game to be all too fun or engaging. I honestly really did not like the fact that every item you get has to be designated to either the A or B button, even your sword or shield, so it really felt like you are constantly pressing the start button to go to your inventory to switch things out. If you are trying to navigate the world, you will need to switch out your inventory all the time to use your sword, use the rock's feather to jump, run, or whatever. That got old to me real quick. And I was a veteran of the Water Temple from Ocarina of Time, when you're constantly switching out your boots. But I don't know, the Game Boy style graphics for a Zelda game just really weren't for me. And I feel like my brother felt the same way, because he got to a certain point where he was stuck, and then just never played it again. Some of the dungeons were okay, but none of them really stand out to me, as I'm even trying to think of them now. Even just navigating the world could get annoying, as you are frequently trying to recall pathing to get from one place to another, as there are a lot of blocked areas or places that you need to switch out for certain items in order to progress. And I don't know why, but I found the music to be annoying in this game. It's Game Boy music, so I don't know what I expected, but I just did not like exploring Koholin Island. I wouldn't say I hate this game by any means, but I also wouldn't say I like it. But I pushed through, I woke up the Windfish, and I finally beat Link's Awakening on New Year's Eve in 2015. I beat the end boss right before my girlfriend and I had to leave for a New Year's party. 
So I waited and waited for my brother to finish his game, and he got to one of the dungeons that he got stuck on, and then he just never played it again. So without telling him, I chose to continue on with the project myself. But keep that between us, please. To keep my Ocarina of Time experience a little fresh, I chose to get the 3D version on the 3DS, since it was at least a new way to play it for me. And yeah, I really had a great time with it. I still personally prefer the original Clastic with the N64 controller as opposed to the small screen handheld, but I appreciated the differences. The graphics look much cleaner and smoother, and the motion controls with the bow and arrow for example are a nice touch, but again, not my preferred playstyle. But the game was still a ton of fun for me. It wasn't much of a challenge, as I still know how to do everything, but I'm glad I tried this version out. So it made me more excited to move on to the next game, Majora's Mask. So I once again went out and bought the 3DS version to get a new experience, since I actually haven't played through the game since it came out in 2000. And I had just about the same feelings as I did with Ocarina in 3D, except I was more excited for Majora this time, since I was less familiar with it. And yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I loved it. I could still sort of remember the first couple dungeons, but the Great Bay Temple felt very unfamiliar, and I barely remembered the Stone Tower Temple existed at all. That almost felt like an entirely new dungeon to me. I played through both of these games fairly quickly, as they are still my favorites in the series. The 3DS remasters are good, I recommend them. My love for Zelda had returned. So I did eventually beat Majora's Mask, and it was time to finally move on to some new Zelda experiences. The next two games were Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, and it was probably, I don't know, 2017 or something? I'm pretty sure Breath of the Wild was about to come out, and here I am getting excited to play some old 2001 Game Boy Color games. Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages are very unique to the series. They are entirely different games, but follow the exact same playstyle and graphics, basically mirroring the style of Link's Awakening. They were both released at the same time in 2001, and can be played in any order. Completing one will give you some bonuses to help you in your quest in the second one. I chose to play Oracle of Seasons first, because the thought of experiencing the Four Seasons sounded more interesting than yet another time travel story. I knew these games got rave reviews, so I was actually really excited. I bought them both on the 3DS eShop, and I got to it. Oracle of Seasons follows Link to the world of Holodrum, where Onox, the General of Darkness, sinks the Temple of Seasons, which causes the seasons to be in disarray, sometimes changing between screens. One section will be winter, and the next will be autumn, and so on. Eventually, you get the Rod of Seasons, where you're able to change the season to help you solve puzzles. Some areas can only be accessed by climbing snow in winter, some need clear paths in the summer, etc. That's basically where the puzzle solving comes into play. It really is such a cool game mechanic. Except, here's the thing. I already didn't love the gameplay and art style of Link's Awakening all too much, so as much as I was into the season's changing idea, I really didn't find myself having all too much fun with this game, unfortunately. There are eight dungeons, which is the standard for a lot of Zelda games, but man, this game really felt like a slog a lot of the time. I was honestly pretty perplexed as to how this got universal praise. With that said, there really is a lot of content and places to explore for an almost 20-year-old Game Boy Color game, so it certainly has its merits, and you can get your money's worth. But I don't know, I still felt pretty disappointed overall. I wanted to love it, but it got to the point where I was more interested in just finishing it rather than wanting to explore and, you know, have fun with the experience. And it really didn't help that I knew Oracle of Ages was next, so I knew I'd have to go through the same game style all over again. I needed a little break between the two, so after that little break I was finally ready to play Oracle of Ages. Maybe I will like this one. Oracle of Ages follows Link in the land of Labrina, where Varen, the Sorceress of Shadows, possesses Nehru and puts the world in time disarray. This one feels more along the lines of Link to the Past and especially Ocarina of Time with the time travel gimmick, as he will be going between two different time periods through the use of the Harp of Ages, except this time it's the past and present rather than the future like in Ocarina. I feel like overall, I guess I liked Oracle of Ages just slightly more than Seasons, which I didn't expect, but I still really wasn't having a great time either. After recently playing through Link's Awakening and Oracle of Seasons for the first time, the repetition of this art style and gameplay and music was really dragging for me. Constantly switching out your items with A and B, I mean I really don't want to play any of these games ever again. Even just navigating the worlds weren't fun to me. Like with Link's Awakening, there are a lot of blocked paths and trying to remember where to go and backtracking constantly. I really wasn't having fun with these games after a while. I'm not saying there needs to be an open field without obstacles for it to be good, but I simply didn't enjoy exploring these worlds. I actually stopped playing right in the middle of it and took a long break. It felt like my love of Zelda was dwindling. 
In that time period, though, something interesting happened, though. The remake of Link's Awakening was due out for the Switch in 2019, and my brother, still thinking he was stalled on our project, actually went out and bought the copy to start his game and play through it. And yeah, he actually did go through and complete the whole game. I've never actually played it myself, but I do own it. But look at that, our project finally made some progress. Next up, Ocarina of Time. Anyway, back to my Oracle of Ages playthrough that I finally finished because I thought the project momentum had returned. I actually did it. I pushed through just wanting it to be done, and even though I wasn't really having fun with it. I knew that the next game was The Wind Waker, and I haven't even played that since 2003, so I was very excited to get out of this handheld era and get back to some fun 3D adventures. So I got the HD version on the Wii U, yeah, I still have a Wii U, and I started my Wind Waker experience. It's probably uh, 2021 now, I don't know, I know the Paraspector channel was going on. I thought the HD version looked amazing to be honest. It had been so long since I played it that I didn't remember where to go or how to do everything, so it was feeling like a fresh experience. I remembered really loving exploring the sea and traveling to the different islands back then, so I was excited to relive that experience. I beat the first couple dungeons and I was having fun with it, but then something happened. I really didn't care about exploring these islands anymore. The thought of picking up the Wii U controller and sailing and trying to find my way started to really not sound like much fun anymore. So just like with Oracle of Seasons and Ages, I began to play through the second half of Wind Waker but feeling like it was out of obligation rather than for fun and entertainment. That's when it finally hit me. Why am I playing these games if I'm not enjoying myself? What am I even doing? I was already so far ahead of where my brother was, so it's not like I was still tied to this project idea. I should be playing games that I actually want to play. I'm currently in my mid-30s, working a full-time job, owning a house, and running my YouTube channel. My free time playing video games has naturally gotten pretty limited, so I feel like I should be enjoying the games I'm playing, not feeling like it's a chore to complete on a checklist. But here's the thing about me. I love doing things in chronological order. I got this from my brother, and it's just always something I've enjoyed doing. If I start to get into a band, I'm gonna collect every CD in order, starting with the first one. If I'm gonna watch a movie series, I'm obviously gonna start with the first one, that's not really a weird thing. But I also kinda had that mindset with video games, and that's something that it took me a long time to realize that it's not really the same type of medium for something like that. But I actually have done this with certain video game franchises, though. I did go through and beat every single Resident Evil game in existence and in order. That is still my favorite gaming franchise of all time, so I really don't get tired of those games. I did the same thing with the main Mario games. I beat every single one in order. I started to do that with Metroid, and uh, yeah, that one's still going on. But there is just something about the Zelda series that really started to not work in the same way for me. So my approach to the second half of Wind Waker was to just stop playing it. It is now May of 2023, and that is the last Zelda game I have played to date. I have never played Skyward Sword, I have never played Breath of the Wild, I have never played A Link Between Worlds or The Minish Cap or any of the DS games, and needless to say, my excitement for playing Tears of the Kingdom is virtually non-existent. Part of that is because I know it's somewhat of a sequel to Breath of the Wild, and my project chronology-oriented brain tells me I should not be going anywhere near that game until I experience Breath of the Wild. So that kind of brings me to the thesis of this video. Thanks for hearing out my introduction. Let's get to the video. What even are my thoughts on the Zelda series anymore? So I started to reflect on the series as a whole. The original Zelda is fun, has its place in the pantheon of gaming history. Whether you like it or not, it is super important and that cannot be overlooked. Zelda 2 is brutally difficult and I can honestly say I don't like it. A Link to the Past has so much meaning for me, but as I've stated, I have no desire to ever play it again. Link's Awakening really wasn't for me, but it was cool that they put so much content and effort into a Game Boy experience. Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask truly are some of my favorite games ever, so they stand the test of time. I did not enjoy Oracle of Seasons or Ages all too much, and I liked Wind Waker until I didn't anymore. So then that leaves Twilight Princess that I played through the one time and enjoyed it, but it's now been like, what, 16, 17 years since I did that? Do I even like the Zelda series anymore? It's like such a weird realization to hit me, because if you would have asked me like 20 years ago what my favorite video game series was, I probably would have said Zelda. But looking at the entire series of games, I can honestly say that I love two of them. I feel very conflicted on the whole thing to the point where it wanted me to make this video. 
I love looking back on the past and reflecting on memories, and it starts to feel like the Zelda series is just living in the past for me. The thought of playing the ones that I've never played before just doesn't really appeal to me all that much. I think The Wind Waker is an excellent game, but I'm at the point in my life where I don't know if this style of gaming is for me anymore. And yeah, that's absolutely sad to realize. I'm just not much of a gamer anymore. With that said, I can still pick up just about any Resident Evil game and have either some fun or a lot of fun with it. I'm even on my third playthrough of the Resident Evil 4 remake right now. I can pick up Pokemon Red or Blue or Soul Silver or even the new Pokemon games and play through those and still have fun. I've done numerous challenges on the TCG for this channel at this point, so it's not like video gaming as a whole has left my life. But I've certainly become more picky in what I want to play and how much I want to play it. So just what happened with me and Zelda? I don't think I'll pick up Wind Waker where I left off and beat it, at least I don't have any desire to do that right now. So if I do choose to go through and play any Zelda game again, I really think I will go against everything I know and just, you know, pick up one that sounds fun at the time and play it. Forget the strict release date order, maybe I should just play A Link Between Worlds. And if I'm not really enjoying myself or having fun with it, then I'll stop. Nobody is forcing me to play it. But that in itself is something that does make me kinda sad. I'm simply getting older and video gaming doesn't mean what it used to. And you know what, as sad as that can be, it's also okay. We all change over time and maybe, just maybe, I'm at a point where playing a Legend of Zelda game just might not be for me anymore. And yeah, it's okay to stop playing a game if you aren't enjoying it. I don't really want to leave this video on a sad note, so I want to try to look at it optimistically. Our tastes change with movies and music and food and all that stuff, so if only playing a Resident Evil or Pokemon game sounds fun to me at the time, there's nothing wrong with that. What I do still have are all the fun memories of experiencing these Zelda games for the first time and looking back on how much fun I actually had with them. Trying to figure out all the puzzles and how to beat the certain bosses and where to get items. I mean, all, all the classic stuff that comes with adventure gaming. At one point, a lot of these games really did mean a lot to me. So basically what I'm trying to say is, don't get mad at me in the comments because I haven't played Breath of the Wild yet. Did you even hear what I was just talking about? God, you never listen to me.